So the overall title is including families and students as partners in the IEP process. And that could actually be expanded really to say the IEP and transition process. And in fact, now that my son Samuel is 18, we really have seen for years the IEP and the transition planning as being almost one and the same. They're really integrated and overlapping. And I got that, I got some good advice years ago from someone who said, you know, these are not separate things, the IEP and the transition once a kid especially is in high school age. So, so that's the title. Um, and I'm going to try and give you a, some philosophical perspective on it, but a lot of, as much as I can, practical, very applicable strategies, I hope. All right? So if something isn't clear, I'm going to expect you guys to ask me to clarify it or add some more information. So quick overview of the agenda for the session. I'm first going to talk about our vision of authentic inclusion. I mean, people, a lot of people have different perspectives on what inclusion is, what it looks like, what it means. So I'm going to talk at least about the perspective that we've taken on for what inclusion is about. Um, I'm going to then talk about the importance of early student involvement in the IEP process. All right, so we'll get to that in just a minute. I'm going to get one of the key themes of this presentation and of, of what I think is important around this whole topic is communication and family-student relationships um, with the school. All right, so we're going to talk about some really specific nuts and bolts strategies, none of which are expensive or overly complicated, but things that we, I found in our work with Samuel, but also what I've learned nationally, are some effective strategies around collaborating with schools. I'm going to give an example of what Samuel's student-led IEP looks like. I mentioned during the keynote that he now is in a leadership role in the IEP process. And uh, although he's been engaged in the IEP meetings since he was in preschool, he's really in a leadership role now. Uh, I'm going to give you specific examples of how this family, and stu family student engagement with the school and with the IEP has really created a stronger IEP. And I'm going to give you specific examples right from Samuel's IEP with his permission, some texts from the IEP that are a result of the, the years of collaboration we've been doing with the school. And I'm going to talk about how, how the IEP process has supported person-centered planning. How many of you, just quick show of hands, are familiar with the idea of person-centered planning? Okay, maybe a third of the room. So we'll talk, I'll define that a little bit and talk about the, the incredible power and importance of person-centered planning, whether it's in school or outside of school. And then I'm going to talk about how both the IEP process and person-centered planning has really informed our whole transition planning process, we're, which we're in the throes of right now, that Samuel's 18 and his senior year of high school. Um, and then finally, I'll just have a few kind of suggested ground rules, nothing too fancy, that just give you a sense of things that we found are really helpful in terms of laying down some ground rules during the whole IEP process. Sound good so far? All right, relevant, I hope. All right. As Samuel would do, just when he was a cute little three-year-old, raise your hand if, uh, or get my attention, call my name, whatever it is. Uh, I'll be scanning the room, and at any point, I want you to make sure to chime in, okay? Because I do go fast, and I, I don't mind being interrupted. All right, so first of all, I think it's really important to start with the law. Many of you probably have seen this at some point in your lives or careers. I doubt you've read it in the last week, but there's a really important passage in the Individuals with Disability Education Act, which reads, the Individuals with Disability Education Act mandates that a school receiving education department funds must place a person with a disability in the regular education environment unless it is demonstrated by the recipient that the student's needs cannot be met satisfactorily with the use of supplementary aids and services. So the reason I think that's so important is people ask me all the time, well, can all kids be included? Or, you know, is there any chance of kids, you know, of, of a school where inclusion is everywhere? And I have been in schools where kids with even the most significant disabilities are included in general ed. It's not that common, but I've seen it function really well. But I think the important thing to keep in mind is that the law says, and I think philosophically and, and research-wise it's the best approach, to have every kid in the general ed classroom as much as possible with the supports they need to be successful. Not just in the classroom, but in all general ed environments. And you know, one of the things I'm going to focus on are some of the things that have really worked for Samuel and that have to be in the IEP in order for them to be kind of binding and to, for them to be effectively implemented by the school. They have to not just be in the IEP, but be in the IEP in a really understandable, clear, concise, easily relatable way by the general education teachers, by the related service providers. Um, and and I think that for every kid, my feeling is until you have tried 
all the available supports and accommodations that you can implement to help this kid be successful, you should not think about pulling them out of the general environment until you've really tried everything you can to help them be successful. Because all the data suggests that if they're successful in general ed, they're going to have better outcomes as adults. Okay? So that's, that's just like this both philosophical and legal underpinning to pretty much everything I'm going to talk about today. So I do hear a lot around the country, well, we tried inclusion, it didn't work for this kid. It just didn't work. So we have these conversations and I say, well, what does inclusion look like for you? What is it? So what I, what I took some time to do was talk about what is authentic inclusion? How do, how do I d define it? How do the people around the country that I really respect define it? What are the qualities of true authentic inclusion? So let me go through what I would describe as those qualities. Um, first of all, you'll be surprised that a lot of these qualities are not just about Samuel's experience, they're about the whole school-wide culture and the, the practices of the school. So first of all, in the school, students with disabilities are proportionally represented in classes, courses, clubs, and extracurricular activities. So what I mean by that is, how many, give me a percentage of what, how many kids in your community, in your district, you feel like have disabilities, if you have any sense of that. You might know as a principal. 10%, 15%, 20%? 10. 10. That sound right? 12, 15, does anybody know? 15, what was that? 17, a little on the high side. Some of the urban areas for a variety of reasons are a little bit higher. So what I would expect in, in these schools is that you walk into any given classroom and maybe, let's say it's 15%, anywhere from 10 to 20% of the kids might have disabilities. But you don't go into classrooms where it's 50%, 70%, and I'm talking about general education environments. Um, of kids with disabilities. And unfortunately, I've heard of a lot of schools where they have like the inclusive class or the inclusion classroom, and it's 50% kids with disabilities. That's not proportional. It's not, I don't think, necessarily a great thing for the kids with disabilities or without disabilities or for the educators for that matter. It's kind of setting them up to fail. So proportionality is really critical in a school, and it should extend, if at all possible, not just to the classrooms and general ed settings, but also to extracurricular activities, sports, theater, etc. All right? Another quality for in authentic inclusion Related services are delivered in a typical inclusive environment. PT, OT, speech, you're not doing pullouts. So when Samuel started elementary school, I remember they said, well, we'll pull them out for speech, we'll pull them out for OT. My wife and I were like, nope, we don't want any pullouts for anything. We don't feel the need for that. We really want all of his related services to be delivered in a general ed setting. And they are like, okay, well, we haven't really done much of that, but we're willing to try. And it worked beautifully. And I see this working all the time around the country in schools where, especially in elementary school, but even in creative ways in older grades where PT can be delivered during physical education class or recess where the kid needs to be mobile anyway and might need some support to participate and a good PT can do it organically in that setting. Um, even stretching on a, on a floor of an elementary school classroom, kindergartners, first, second, third graders, they're really not going to care. They're going to get used to that very, very quickly. Um, OT is delivered in art or music where a kid might need to practice some fine motor skills. Speech might be delivered during some time in the cafeteria to help support that kid with their language. Now, it doesn't mean you can never have one-on-one -on -one, um, time with the kid. In elementary school, Samuel needed some oral motor work where the speech therapist had to really like get into his mouth and do some, some, some motoric exercises. So we agreed to bring him early to school a couple days a week to have that work done rather than have him have that, which is probably inappropriate in a classroom, or have him pulled out. But Samuel's now a senior in high school and he's never been pulled out of class for any related services. And he gets a significant amount of OT, PT, and speech. But we've just worked with the school to do it either integrated into general ed or have it delivered during prep periods or free periods or, you know, bef you know we try not to do it before or after school because he's already tired at the end of a school day. Okay, but that's, I think, a, a, something to, to shoot for in my mind. Because again, I mean, the main thing here is not having kids miss academic instruction. I mean, that's what it comes down to. You want these kids to, ex to experience the full academic instruction. Teachers have the skills to effectively practice differentiated instruction. You know, in our district, thankfully, they've put a lot of energy and time into training teachers, and hopefully this is happening at the pre-service level and, and, and in conferences like this and in college where you're learning to differentiate. Just like that teacher, I mean, one of the lines in the film I showed earlier, Taja, which always gets me, is when the teacher says, if you're not willing to differentiate, differentiate your instruction, 
even for students with autism, then you're in the wrong profession. And I can't say that, right? But she could say that she's a teacher. And it, well, I don't know if it hit you like it hits me, but I always that line always resonates with me. Um, and also universal design for learning, which we'll talk more about. But the idea that information can be delivered in so many different ways, auditorially, visually, uh, through experience, experiential learning. Um, and, and students can demonstrate their knowledge in all those different ways. If a school supports and cultivates differentiation, UDL, it's going to create a much more successful environment for all different kinds of learners, whether they have an IEP or not. Okay? Um, collaborative teaching. How many of you have or experienced collaborative teaching in your schools? Some of you, a few of you. So that can be de de defined a lot of different ways. Um, traditionally, you see it as like a regular ed trained teacher and a special ed trained teacher co-teaching in a classroom. But I've been in schools around the country and the whole SWIFT project, which some of you may be familiar with, um, looks at co-teaching more broadly. And I've been in classrooms where a speech and language pathologist is co-teaching with a general ed. The paraprofessional is co-teaching. You know, um, not necessarily in the same exact way, but they're supporting the learning for all students in the classroom. I've seen um, all different kinds of related service providers doing co-teaching. So it's kind of an all hands on deck mentality that if you're trying to have kids with disabilities included in, in classes, it's often going to take more than one adult in that classroom to make it to make everything work, and it has to be done in a really intentional way. So the, the most inclusive schools I've been to do a lot of collaborative teaching. Um, I talked about UDL a little bit, and then peer support is a constant goal. When I talk about peer support, I probably should change the language here because we talked about this in the last session. Um, I don't mean like someone being assigned to Samuel as a peer. I mean peers working together throughout the day. And again, I don't know if this is happening in your schools, but the schools that I've been in that are really seem to be the most engaging for the students, throughout the day, peers have a lot of opportunity to work in small groups in different classes. And I'm seeing this happen in elementary schools, in middle schools, in high schools, where it's not just the teacher delivering the instruction the whole day, in a lecture type of format, it's just a lot of movement in the classroom, a lot of station teaching, a lot of peers working with each other. And I know for Samuel, he thrives in that environment. He really likes working with his peers. And I think for a lot of students, it's a very engaging way to, to go through their day. All right? Questions, comments, anything so far that doesn't make sense or you're like, yeah, I don't buy that. <laughs> anything so far? All good? All right. I'm, I'll keep an eye on the room. All right. So. I think unfortunately for a lot of people, especially a lot of families, the IEP is just this really scary, overwhelming document and process. And when they think of an IEP, they don't get warm, fuzzy feelings. They feel overwhelmed, they feel like they're going to come into a meeting and be told all the things that their kid <laughs> is struggling with or that in ways their kid is deficient. And you know, I have sometimes I have people say to me, yeah, we just can't get the parents engaged in the IEP meetings. And we can talk more about that, and there are probably a variety of reasons. But one of them, it, I think, is that a lot of parents just don't really want to be depressed. They don't want to walk into these meetings where all they're being told is all the ways their child is struggling, and it's all about these measurable outcomes, like the child will do these four things five times a week. I don't even read that part of our IEP, to be honest. It's, to me, it's more the, it's like the narrative, it's the context, it's, uh, it's the meat of the IEP that talks about Samuel's learning styles, his strengths, his challenges, but not in a way that necessarily just quantifies it all, in, in a more thoughtful way, and we'll, I'll talk more about that. Anyway, so we've really tried to work with our school to see the IEP as a roadmap as a roadmap for transition and inclusion. And that's the way we've always approached this since he was very young. Like what is, if we're building a beautiful roadmap for Samuel's education and life, what would it look like? That's what the IEP should look like. And the schools, for the most part, have been very much on board with that. Now I know there are requirements in the IEP and you need to fill out different forms and all this stuff, but I believe that in every state I've been in, hopefully here, there's plenty of areas in IEP for there to be some really good narrative discussions and descriptions about the student's strengths, challenges, and learning strategies. So there's a, a friend of mine named Beth Swedeen who's in Wisconsin, really I think puts this whole notion beautifully about the fact that a lot of the work that is important in terms of making this successful is about relationship building. So, you know, we have lots of, lots of strategies in the IEP around a student's measurable progress, but there aren't a whole lot of like areas, form, you know, spaces in the form to talk about how do we build strong relationships between families and schools, right? That's not like a standard section of the IEP, but I think it should be. I think it's like, I think the most important thing 
for successful IEP development and family engagement. So Beth talks about how authentic inclusion requires as much focus on communication, interaction, and relationship building as it does on curriculum modifications and accommodations. And so I think there's a lot of attention put, as there, as there should be, on modifications, accommodations, but there is as much conscious focus on relationship building in the IEP process. So it's partly about relationship building, which we'll, I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute, about some specific strategies. But I also think it's so critical to have early student participation. So how many of you, what's the youngest in your schools or communities, what's the youngest in which you've experienced students attending their IEP meetings? Just call out some ages or grades. 14? Kindergarten. Kindergarten? I have fifth graders. Fifth graders? Fourth graders. Fourth graders? Anybody else? First grade. First grade, okay. You're actually a little younger than the last session. This is a repeat session, and the last session was almost all fifth and sixth grade starting. So, so I think that the students can participate as young as preschool in their IP meetings. Does that mean they're gonna sit through the whole meeting? Not necessarily. That, that's not necessarily the most important thing. I do think that young kids, and sam has been doing this since he was in preschool, they can even just come to their IP meeting for five minutes, the first five minutes. Say hi to everybody, make sure they know who's in the room. Um, you, could, you, could ex you could explain to that child in whatever age appropriate way is, is uh, possible why mommy and daddy or mommy or daddy or grandma or whoever's in the, you know, why they're there. We're here, Johnny, we're here to like make sure you're successful in school. We want to help you be having a good time at school and feeling like you're learning and that's why we're all here to meet. That's why we're talking about this. I don't think a lot of kids hear that. I don't think a lot of kids get that talk especially from a young age. But they should, they should know that this is a meeting that is about them. They should feel empowered that they are at the hub of it. And as much as possible, they should participate. So in preschool, we used to just have Samuel come in and just like show some of his recent art projects. Say hi to everybody, bring his cute face in there. I mean, that certainly sets the tone of the meeting also, I think for a lot of people to have that child there at the beginning is a pretty important reminder of what this meeting's about. Have that child present some of their artwork, and then if they want to go back to class and be with their friends, which is probably where they want to be, go back to class. But it really sets the tone. And then um, Samuel has also, since middle school, probably late elementary school, has been coming to all his IP meetings for the entire meeting. And, uh, and, and part of what we find happening is it does change the tone of the meeting. I think it makes the meeting a lot more collaborative and constructive. We always try to make sure we're talking in language that Samuel can understand, and sometimes I need, we need to remind everyone about that. But that also, for a lot of families, it's also gonna make the, the discussion more accessible to them. You know, whether they're English language learning families or whether they're families that don't necessarily know all the acronyms that are thrown around in IEP meetings. So I think it, and it's, a, and it's a way also for families to feel even more engaged in the meeting because their child is there, if the child is there, they're probably going to be more engaged as well. Any concerns or questions, or does that seem like a radical idea, a reasonable idea to have kids that involved? We're going to talk too a lot more about self-determination skills. But somebody asked me earlier, you know, do you is there like a self-determination workshop you'd suggest kids take? I think this, I think self-determination has to be developed at every stage of a kid's life, almost every day. I don't think it's something that can happen just through one training. It happens through being engaged in the process. So kind of transitioning right to that point. This really, having kids engage in the meeting early on develops a sense of ownership. I've, I've talked to many high school kids, but they don't, they don't know really what an IEP is. I mean, they have IEPs, and they don't know what it is, they don't know what's in it, they don't know why these meetings happen, because they're not really engaged in the process. And I think that's bad, I think that's dangerous. I think the kids should have a sense of ownership of their IEP. And again, that can't happen overnight. You, it's, it's, like, it's like having to talk about sex. You can't start at age like 18 and hope that it's just gonna like click. You, you gotta kinda start to have these conversations younger. Same thing with the IEP. You've gotta bring the kid into the process early on and slowly in whatever age appropriate way you can. Anyway, it's not, these meetings should not be seen by the student as just about paperwork and meetings and stress. It should be about how are we gonna make you successful. Um, and then having the student in the meeting gives them a chance to exercise self-determination skills. So Samuel has a lot of communication challenges. Um, 
he's, you know, he's a kid. He doesn't necessarily want to sit through an hour-long meeting. But we're constantly turning to Samuel, and we've been doing this from a very young age, asking him to, if he, if he feels supportive about some decisions we're making. And, and especially now that he's in high school, even through middle school, I can't recall a single time we made an important decision without him buying it, without him feeling supportive. And him, like, giving us a physical thumbs up or thumbs down. And Samuel, in his very straightforward way, you know, physical thumbs up, physical thumbs down, he can tell us what he wants. And I think that almost any kid you work with, I would hope, I mean, there's some kids that may fall outside of this, can, can somehow express yes or no. That's really all you need, is to f at least get the ability to get a yes or no out of a child. They can develop self-determination through that. And, uh, and if you have them regularly in these meetings, you're developing these skills in a way that's also going to translate into later on, when they have to start advocating for themselves as, as adults. Um, and I, we haven't done a lot of this, but I've heard other families who have brought classmates into the IEP meetings or siblings, because a lot of times the classmates may have creative ideas or perspectives that the student wouldn't necessarily bring up on their own. It creates like an ally situation. Something in the last, um, last session talked about uh, one family, one child that, whose both parents had died, and they, they Assigned, assigned or, or asked for a volunteer for a, a, an adult in the building, another teacher, to be that child's kind of mentor. Someone they could check in with in the morning, check out with late in the day, who would come to the IP meetings, almost like an advocate for this child. And that was, a, that was I like that, it was a pretty innovative idea. Because I think a lot, of, a lot of people think, well, what do we do with parents who aren't that engaged? And we'll talk more about that. But I think that's in some cases where the school has to step it up even more you know, to advocate and, and, and have a high expectations for that kid. All right, go ahead. I 100% agree. I wonder if you had any thoughts about the student who does have uh, have a disability but doesn't want to recognize it all, does not want right. to discuss it, doesn't really want to be active participant even if their parent is working on, on that because they, they feel that, that makes them different no matter what is discussed, no matter what. Any, any thoughts yeah. on that? Because we do run into that. I sure. I run into that. Yep. And just, um, because you spend a lot of time saying you can do everything, you can do what you want to do, there are supports, but if they, they don't really want to engage in that because they want to do it alone, it, right. it, it just offers a quandary. It's a great question. Yeah, can you, people hear in the back the question clearly enough? So it's a great question. I don't have all the answers, but I'll just share a couple thoughts. I think that I think that a lot of these discussions can happen without necessarily focusing on disability, or even without talking about disability. I think that if it's framed as we want to help make sure you're successful in school, you know, and, and every kid isn't necessarily going to know what every other kid is experiencing. Maybe, as far as they know, every kid's having meetings like this. You know, I mean, I think I think it could be framed that way. As you know, a lot of kids in our school. Um, need some extra support to be successful. Johnny, we want you to be successful, so we decide we're gonna get together regularly as a team, and we're gonna create this blueprint, it's called an IEP, we're gonna create this blueprint that's like, a, to help you be successful. So let's first have you, Johnny, let's say elementary, middle school, tell us all the things that you're good at. Tell us all your strengths. Let's make sure they get into this roadmap. Let's really build off your strengths. Um, all right, let's talk now about some of the things that you struggle with. And let's try and figure out some ways to get through those struggles and what, what, can you, what, can, what can be supportive. Who are some people that have been really helpful in the school? How can we make sure that they're engaged in your life? Um, you know, I, I really think those conversations can happen if need be. I mean, I think there's a real, a real value to disability awareness and disability pride. So I would, of course, try to facilitate that. But if that's just not going to happen, I think these conversations can still happen outside of getting too much into depth around disability definitions and labels. OK. OK. Great, great question. Anybody else right now? Questions, comments? Go ahead. Along the same lines, the last IEP meeting I said was a general ed teacher. But the mother was adamant that the daughter not even know we were having the meeting. And she, I think she didn't have the, the confidence. And it made me really sad because I'm thinking how much more we could help this little girl if she knew yeah. what we had planned for her. Right. How old was she, the girl? Third grade. Third grade, yeah. The mom said, please don't even tell her sure. this meeting. I don't want her to know. I think if she gets pulled into another room for then again, with you were talking about just in, have inclusion constantly. Right. Don't pull anybody 
Right. Which I thought was really a good. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I do think the parents have that right. You know, if, if they if they if that's where they are, especially with a child fairly young, it's certainly their right, right? And they may have a lot of reasons, you know, that we don't understand, or, or maybe it'd be helpful to know the reasons. But kind of like this question, I think ideally you could make a really persuasive case to the parent while respecting their right. Here's why we think it would be helpful. And I, I think this whole self-determination piece resonates with parents. I think to, to help them understand, we feel we, we would like to make sure your daughter has a chance to be engaged in the decision making in whatever way that she can be around her future. And we don't and you could say we don't have to frame it as IEP disability. We just want her to have a voice at the table. And we want to make sure that anything we implement she feels like she's in the loop on that you know and that we know that kids who have practice at self-determination from a young age, and you can frame self-determination any way you want if it's a different way to describe it, are likely to have better success as adults. I mean, so I don't know what would be persuasive to this parent, but I do think that breaking it down and, and really talking about why you as a school feel like you want that child at the table in really respectful ways might make the difference. And if she still doesn't agree, then you say, okay, that's your prerogative, maybe next year, or maybe in six months or three months. Great, good question. Anybody else for now? Those are great questions. Keep them coming anytime. All right. So we talked a little bit about this. You know, really, if the IEP is not strength based, I think there's something wrong with the process. Um, and again, I think this can really be a disincentive for a lot of families to be engaged because I would love for that all those meetings to start with what are the strengths? Let's, talk, let's go over the strengths again. Let's make sure we're building off the strengths of this child. Let's make sure they're written really clearly in the IEP. As I said earlier, students can share their own interests, their favorites. You know, it doesn't have to be, Johnny, how do you learn in school? What's challenging for you? What's, it could be like, what's your favorite subject? You know, what's, what's the best part of your school day? What, what have you had the most fun with so far this year? I mean, put it in terms, that still can draw the strengths out, I think, of a child once they start describing these things. Um, what are your least favorite subjects? What do, you, what do you find is the hardest part of your day? You know, I mean, those, that kind of communication can help feed into the whole strategy around the IEP. One thing that we did, have anybody, have, I think somebody said in the last session that there is a way to, there's like a function in the IEP uh, platform here in Indiana that exports a two-page kind of brief, almost like an executive summary. Does this sound familiar to anybody? IEP at a glance. At a glance. Right. So that's great. I don't know how successful, you know, how effective it is. But in, we, we did our own organic at a glance in New Hampshire in Samuel's life where we... I would find as a new teacher, like a general ed teacher who's about to get Samuel as a student, really overwhelming to be at hand at this 35 page IEP, which is about how long his is, and say, okay, here he is, here's the kid that you got starting you know, next week. But, so what we did is we work with Samuel and his team from in the spring, like towards the end of the year, we create a, a two page, like at a glance summary of Samuel's strengths, challenges, and some basic things they can do to really help him be successful. And some of it is just like the thumbs up, thumbs down, his communication, the fact that he loves NASCAR and the Patriots and the Red Sox, that's a good communication you know, point for him. Um, and I, so I think that if the at a glance that you have has the opportunity to have some of that narrative part, some of the more descriptive part, that's great. If it doesn't, you know, maybe there's a way to supplement it or, or change it. But I really feel like it should be a document that anybody could pick up with no background on a kid and get like a quick glance at that kid's strengths challenges. Okay? We've even put pictures in it. We've made it like kind of UDL. All right, so I think the other thing is, is in terms of how often you convene. I think this is a really another important discussion. And not just convening as a meeting, but in terms of overall communication day to day. So I feel like a successful IP process goes well beyond that one annual meeting. And I don't know if that's your, your norm, but we find that the little communications that happen almost every day are just as important as that big IEP meeting. So I was telling the session earlier, I, I've learned now that the teacher of record, right, is the term you use here in Indiana. We don't use that, but I'm going to use that as a way to describe what we would call Samuel's special education coordinator, similar idea. Um, we have one now, Howie, who's great. He's really high energy, he's really technological, and he's a big texter. And not everyone will want to do this, but I'm just telling you kind of our experience, is that I will on a typical day have two to three texts with Howie. Just like quick questions he's got, it might be a health question, might be something educational, but, but he finds, and I'm fine with it, because I also text a lot, that it just, it just minimizes so many misunderstandings to just have these open lines of communication. And we email as well, or if, there, if there's multiple people need to be part of the conversation, it's through email. Again, I don't know if that works for every family, I don't know if that works for every school or educator, but 
we find that having that regular open communication electronically <laughs> allows us to meet less often but have really open communication. And the other thing, again, I don't know whether this would fly in your schools, but it's been great for us, is that Samuel, for either Howie or sometimes the paraprofessionals, if there's a great moment happening in school, like the day Samuel helped sell the homecoming tickets, she snapped a picture, she knew, you know, she got permission from the other student and just texted it to me. It said, you know, great moment, Samuel's selling homecoming tickets. And I think the point here is that Families are so often used to hearing concerns from school or like negative situations. And the more we can balance that communication with just hearing some quick positive snapshots, I mean, I'm sure some of the family members, especially in the room, can appreciate how profoundly happy that makes us to just hear something really positive that happened in school. And I know it's like one more thing for teachers to do, but if done in a really efficient way, it's not that big a deal, right? I mean, Howie, um, very creative teacher, Samuel does get some individualized instruction for math in a small group because he really struggles with math. So Howie created a whole fantasy football league this year for the math class. And they're learning math through like drafting and tracking points and all these things through fantasy football. And he recorded some video of their draft, their fantasy football draft, and he uploaded the video to the Google Drive, shared it with the few families that were involved. And I was able to sit in my office and like watch Samuel in school in this really fun, creative process. And that type of communication back and forth, I feel like lays the foundation for a healthy relationship through the more difficult parts of the IEP process. Um, in elementary school, we always felt welcome to come into the classroom. Um, how many of you use Google Classroom in your schools? Any of you, some of you? I mean, I know there are other platforms. I'm just more familiar with Google Classroom. That's been a real game changer, I feel like, in high school because in terms of keeping up a couple ways. One is just in terms of me being able to just peek and see where Samuel's homework is at or whether he's turned it in or what the assignments are. But the teachers are using Google Classroom to create um, modifications for Samuel. So if, if a, let's say um, there's a, an, a, a quiz or something, a take home quiz, and most kids might have 20 questions. Well, for Samuel to answer 20 questions in the way he communicates would take him like days. So the teacher might say, well, here are the five really important questions that I want the student to learn. They just load that to Google Classroom. Or they might give students an opportunity to take in the information through a video or a podcast or a reading or you know four or five different ways they just load up all those options on the Google Classroom and then the student might be able to give the information back in several different ways by doing a short video or writing a poem and and anyway it's just it's created this incredible way to to create accommodations and for the families or whoever is helping the student if need be at home to complete the assignments so I'm, I'm bringing this up because I feel like all this is tied into all the accommodations that are developed through the IP or that need to be in the IP. And then finally, how many of you have had a homeschool notebook go back and forth in any capacity? A few of you. So um, this is, in, in elementary school, it was just like some, some writing and some notes from the paraprofessional with a teacher and maybe some photographs. This is Samuel's high school page, and I'll explain what this is, and then I'll show you one that's filled out right after this. So Samuel has you know, four or five periods throughout the day of classes. So on the left it has a list of the periods. And then each field has some room for activity, you know, some notes, what was happening. Usually the, he has a one-on-one -on -one para, and the para is usually writing some notes in each field. But sometimes, as you'll see, an OT might write some notes, or a PT, or speech, or a general ed teacher. And then on the right, there's three columns. And we're also very concerned about Samuel's health. And Samuel has three health issues that come up almost every day. One is, we call them wiggles, but they're these tremendous dyskinesic, they're called movements for kids with cerebral palsy or people can often just have a lot of difficulty controlling their movements. And it can be very difficult and almost dangerous because you could hit, hurt yourself and it's, sometimes they get really bad for Samuel. So we want to track the wiggles, we want to track his energy because he's on four different anti-seizure meds right now and that can just zonk his energy. So we, we want to get a sense of his energy fluctuations, see if we need to adjust the timing on the medicine, things like that. And then like a lot of people with CP, he drools and we're trying to get that, that under control. So. There's a scale for each of those categories from zero to three. So zero would be not wiggly at all, three would be very wiggly. Zero would be for energy, like he literally fell asleep in school. Three would be lots of energy today, it was great. So then when the page is filled out, every day we get this home. It's the first thing I check when I get home from work and I look and see how Samuel's health was. <laughs> the, all the stuff on the right, those numbers, are data collection for us. So that when we go to Samuel's neurologist, 
for our you know, three times or four times a year appointments, we can say, you know, or maybe we need something more pressing, we'll call him. It seems like Samuel gets exhausted every day at 11. Is there any way we can adjust the seizure meds a little bit to adjust for that? Or, boy, that medicine you put him on for drooling is really helping. Look, he's got like no drooling at school. Or, you know, the wiggles have been really bad. Can we, but without having that data, it would be really hard for us to understand how to, how to help Samuel uh, in that way. And then in the narrative part, you can't really read them from where you are, but there's um, like a note from the OT just saying, you know, period five. This was his prep period, like a down period where they did some related services. Stretching, range of motion, brain gym, target practice, different things they talked about. PT talks about doing some, working on some sit to stand, some other activities. But my favorite note came from his para, and he said, Sam had an excellent, excellent opportunities to giggle and use some foul language passing through the hallway. Epic. <laughs> and I love that note because what happened was that Samuel, a couple years ago, Samuel worked with his brother Isaiah and one of his support, his support person, Alex. They, they got together and they had a great time putting a page on his Toby that's just like unbelievable curse words, like anything you could think of. It's like cursing like a sailor. But he's 18 year old, right kid, right? And so he should be able to curse if that's what he wants to do. Self-determination. So uh, I guess in the hallway they were going through and he saw some kids and Samuel just started, you know, having some good conversations with them, using some curse words. And to her credit, the paraprofessional saw that as like a normal part of being a teenager. In the hallway, you know, out of the way, and, and wrote that in the book. So this is just a great low-tech but highly effective way to have that back and forth communication. Any questions? I'm, I'm curious if anybody's had a similar. I yeah. like, I would just like to throw in. So I'm the mom of a six year old with Down syndrome who's now in kindergarten and she's practically nonverbal. She comes home from school every day and I say, how was school? Did you have fun? She says, nope. <laughs> Favorite word. <laughs> so just like without this, I would have zero idea what happened to my daughter every day at school. And so sometimes I just get a note like it says who she played with right. or some cute little anecdote. And it makes my day. It means the world to me to know that like somebody's taking the time to write that kind of stuff down. So. Yeah, that's a great, thank you for sharing that. It's a great addition. <laughs> and, it, and it does probably help build the foundation of trust and relationship with you in the school as well. I, th I think a lot about like closed Facebook groups and things like that, Instagram, because you know, I, I know it's easy to say, oh, we can't do that. You know, that would violate FERPA and all these different, but if there's a way to do it and to not just say no, you, get, you go to where the parents are, you know, and parents, I mean, to get that letter in the mail three days later with notice of the IEP meeting, whatever, you know, if communication just happens that way, it doesn't feel very accessible or engaging to families. But listen, like, like most of us, parents, where are parents these days? They're on Facebook, Instagram, maybe some on Snapchat. I, I'm not saying you need to do all this. You need to find what your comfort zone is. I mean, Howie, our teacher of record, or whatever the terminology is, he's, he's totally fine being texted on a Sunday night at 10. A lot of people would not like that. I and, and so you said, you know, and I'm not saying everyone should do that, but you know, you, you feel, Find a way that's comfortable for you. And it may be that some parents, that's the only way you can communicate with them is through text. And they, they won't respond to phone calls or emails. So maybe it's just more isolated situations where you deal with certain parents that way. So this, I want to just talk about Samuel's monthly check-in meeting. So this is a particularly big group, right? I showed this during the keynote as well. And uh, so we don't, not every meeting is like this. This was like a really big middle school kind of big meeting. Usually they're smaller, but, I'll, but I will tell you who's at the table because sometimes we get close to this many people. So you see Samuel, to his left is our out of school support person, Alex, who we hire, my wife and I both work full time, so we have somebody pick Samuel up from school and help him with personal care in the afternoon. They do homework together, et cetera. He helps in the mornings too. So Alex, then there's um, a speech and language pathologist, guidance counselor, one, the morning paraprofessional, uh, the man with the orange shirt is actually, was our our support person in training who was taking over from Alex. His, the uh, history teacher, English teacher, biology teacher, my wife on the far right, the uh, teacher of record with her back to us, and the afternoon power professional, and then Proton, the service, our service dog, Samuel's service dog under the table. And if you notice um, on his right, there's that little yellow button, and that's how Samuel powers through the IEP. PowerPoint. So the way it works is in the days leading up to one of these meetings, Samuel and his teacher of record work together on the agenda for the meeting. And it's not, we don't like start from scratch every time, it just tweaks to the PowerPoint because it's pretty consistent. Um, but Samuel's aware of what the agenda is going to be, and we've been doing this since middle school, since like sixth or seventh grade. And it's amazing how much more engaged Samuel has been in the IEP meetings since he's had control, some control over the agenda. Not and control and involvement in the agenda. And so he has this pre-planning time where he's working 
ahead of time to understand what we're going to be talking about. So then he starts clicking through the, the PowerPoint. Very simple, I mean, he's got motor challenges, but he can hit that button. So this was a couple years ago, it was a 10th grade team check-in meeting. Um, my meeting, first of all, it's you know my meeting, right? He's taking ownership of it, it's from his voice. Thanks everyone for coming. In make sure that if we haven't already done so, everyone does a quick introduction in the room to get to, to know each other. Which is, again, really important for the student too, right? To have that moment. Even if they've met people before, certain disabilities might you know, make it harder for them to remember everybody. Or they're just a teenage boy, <laughs> which, you know, with that frontal lobe issue. Um, then we do a quick agenda, classes, communication device, homework. We have a little fun agenda, fly to the moon, win Nobel Peace Prize, fall in love. <laughs> keep it light, keep it funny, bring some food into the room. That's always helpful. And this is probably the single most important part of the PowerPoint. First of all, we always start with general education because that way the gen ed teachers can leave after maybe 15, 20 minutes, right? They report out, some of them stay. But a lot of times it just is asking for like 15, 20 minutes of their time. Maybe it used to be once a month, now it's like once every two months. Um, and often it's during their existing, like in freshman year, he had, they had a cluster and they were all meet, they had standing meeting times anyway, you know, the cluster. So we were just coming into one of those standing meeting times to have this discussion. Anyway, the important part is what's going well, what could be improved? And if you just ask those two questions, that opens the door to almost anything you could possibly want to talk about in a school environment, right? What's going well, what could be improved? Starts with strengths. What are the strengths? What's going well? Which gives the teacher a, a nice opportunity to talk about some really positive things that are happening here, and for the student to hear that. And then the teacher should feel comfortable, hopefully at that point, talking about some of the challenges that are still happening, whatever they could possibly be. And then we just go through each subject. What's going well? What can be improved? Maybe five minutes per teacher, approximately. And you know, if all that other communication's been happening, the emails and the other stuff, then it's, you're not gonna be tackling these enormous issues that no one's seen coming. You've already had, hopefully, some communication about some of these issues previous, but this way the whole group can hear. Because you know, like, the, the OT probably hasn't heard some of these things, or the speech language pathologist hasn't heard these things. Science, homework, all right? So we just go boom, 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 boom. And then at that time, often the Jenna teachers will leave, right, thank you so much. And then we get into, then we hone the group to more like related service providers, family, um, special ed coordinator, teacher of record, the special ed director has sometimes come to the meetings, rarely does the principal come, but usually special ed director, if when possible, will come to these meetings. Um, talk about the communication device, Samuel's got thousands of words in his device, he knows where everything is, he's got incredible motor memory. One of the big parts of the IEP that we've made a big focus, and not just the IEP, but communication, is getting content vocabulary from the gen ed teachers before it comes up in class. Because if Samuel can't, like he had, freshman year he had world, geography and culture, and they did a whole unit on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in Israel. You know, to, devices don't come pre-programmed with in, intifada or, <laughs> you know, or a Palestinian, and they don't come with those words. You have to get them in there. So the, the teacher was able to think about, okay, here are all the, ter here's the terms that are gonna come up in this unit, and Sam will pre-program them into his device. So then we do a quick update on OTPT speech. Um, you know, even in this case, especially with, with OT, for a kid like Samuel, there's a lot of personal hygiene and personal care issues that need to be discussed. The gen ed teachers don't need to hear all that, right? I mean, that could be a smaller group that's more related service providers, family. Be, you know, it's so important to also be respectful of the, of the student. Um, and then we talk quickly about extracurricular, um, what's going well, what can be improved. So the whole, you know, this whole educational experience. We used to, when he was younger, have a quick kind of in, um, discussion of some transition planning, which we started around age 15. I think it should start ideally even younger. For kids with disabilities, you should really be having these conversations at age 14 to start them. Um, but now we're having separate meetings just for transition because it's such an intense focus. So, we're, so the same people that are in that larger meeting, it's a smaller subgroup that's talking specifically about transition planning, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. All right, so that's it. That's pretty much his his student-led IEP meeting. I mean, you could make that PowerPoint probably in less than an hour, work with a student, just get some Google images, make it fun. Questions about that process? Pretty straightforward. I can promise you, if you get the kids involved in that capacity, you're gonna see so much more engagement from the kids if they have some opportunity to participate in that kind of leadership way. Plus, leading a meeting is a pretty damn good life skill and professional skill, right? I mean, that's a facilitated meeting in any capacity. That's critical for so many professions. Do they discuss like goals and accommodations as well? Um, 
That's a good question. There, there usually is an, a specific meeting dedicated just, I mean, the accommodation discussion is ongoing the whole year, right? I mean, that's, a lot of his accommodations have been in, in place for a lot of years, so it's not like we need to reinvent them every year. We need to tweak them. And then, uh, and the goals, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I leave the goals up to the related service providers. If they want to determine how many times he should do something, how many times a week, like they write those, we review them, make sure they're not completely unrealistic. It's not a part of, like, it's not a part of this discussion. It, it, I think that, to me, that's a big time sink, like to just think about all those things. I'd rather they have a little space and time to think about what they want in PT and OT and speech, write them out into the IEP and just have us make sure that we review it. That's the feeling. But accommodations are part of, I think, the natural discussion, you know, through, through these meetings and through the other discussions. <coughs> yeah, any other questions? Great. So, so I feel like this whole, everything I've talked about so far, I feel like has really read, uh, led to a stronger IEP. So as I think you've gotten the sense, Samuel's a really audiovisual kind of guy. He loves watching movies, making movies, you know, getting his information through auditory learning, through visual learning, and, and creating movies. It's just like any kid, they've got, he's got his strengths. These are his strengths. He does his, his New England Patriots report every uh, Friday on the, on the TV station. Uh, he's taking a lot of journalism, multimedia classes right now, and he really sees that as his career path. So in the IEP, we made it crystal clear in working with the school that Sam was an auditory learner. And this has been in his IEP since he was quite young, I think elementary school. And I remember, that, I remember in elementary school the time where we said, we really think in his IEP it needs to say that all the content that's being delivered educationally in school needs to be available to Samuel auditorially, one way or another. Whether it's through the teachers talking, whether it's through someone reading some material out loud for him, whether it's through books on tape, whether it's through now in high school having material delivered in a universally designed way, you know, through, through different mechanisms, through auditory or visual. Without that, Samuel can't learn. He can't read because his tracking, I, I, I'm forgetting who I've said these things to <laughs> at this point in the day, but he, because of his cerebral palsy, he can't track clearly. His eyes just bounce around too much. So he can do some whole world word reading, but he really can't read with any fluency. But he's got a mind like a trap. He remembers everything, and it's, but it's through auditory learning. And I've actually known like, people who are blind who can listen to books on tape two and three times as fast as I can and retain all of it because they're so used to getting their information auditorially. So in, in Samuel's IEP, it says that the highlighting is just for the purpose of this demonstration. It's not in his in the presentation. It's not in his IEP that way. But it says, parents would like to make certain that Samuel has easy access to curriculum being auditory information. He learns best through universally designed material, material presented auditorially, blah, 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 blah. This was, this was combined work between us and the school in terms of describing Samuel's learning style. And so the way it's typically worked over the years is um, his teacher of record will export the draft IEP, which you know is not reinvented every year, it's just tweaked every year and changed to us as a Word document. And my wife and I are very comfortable you know, working with Word documents and track changes and we just start editing it. And we make suggestions and changes and we might tweak the language and then it goes back to him. And he, if he, you know, he'll push back if he thinks something's not accurate or doesn't feel appropriate, but usually it's a very collaborative back and forth like editing a document together. Uh, and I, the last group said that was pretty feasible in terms of the technology you have that could be export as a document, whether it's a PDF or a Word doc, and share that with a family. You know, not all families are going to want it that way. My wife likes it printed out so she can mark it up. My handwriting's terrible. I like to do it on the computer. So, you know, ask the family what's the best format for you to take a look at this. Would you like it printed out? Would you like it emailed, et cetera? Some families might need it translated. You know, some families might need it read out loud. Did someone say something? No. All right. So, Anyway, so that's one, I'll show you another example in a minute about another part of his IEP. But another part of this whole process is Samuel really has taken on an increasingly active role in determining his accommodations and also in executing his accommodations. What I mean by that is, let's say an accommodation for one kid is they sometimes need to work in a quieter environment, right? A lot of kids probably would benefit from that whether they have a disability or not. Um, another accommodation might be that a student really obviously works a lot better when they're in a peer group, right, when they're working with other students. And that's not always possible, but it's, it's sometimes possible. Especially in high school, there's a lot more flexibility, I find. So Samuel has a self-advocacy page on his device where he can say, I feel like I need to work in a quieter space, or I'd really like to work on a peer with this. And again, in high school, like that's not uncommon for a high school student to say, you know what, can I just go to the study hall and work on this, or can I go to the library? I mean, this stuff happens all the time with students in high school. So Samuel 
in the same kind of appropriate situations can, can ask, I, I'd like to work in a quieter spot or can I work with a friend on this? But that's really different than some power professional or teacher saying, okay, Sam, well now it's time for you to go here. Or Sam, well now it's time for you to do this. You know what I mean? I mean, with, it, it, it gives him, again, these self-advocacy skills, the self-determination. I feel like it needs to be built into his day all the time to cultivate these self-advocacy skills. Um, he also has access to audiobooks. So rather than remove him from the classroom in order to learn something, you've got a situation where it's hard to see on the screen here, but his peers had an independent reading time. Well, Sam took the same book on audio, put a set of headphones on, and he was able to take in the information auditorially while the other kids were reading, which kept him in the classroom. Right? He's, e he's even got, at times, an iPad, which again, a lot of schools have iPads these days, not all, but many, or similar devices, Chromebooks, or et cetera. And he will sometimes watch a video from, let's say, Brain Pop or Khan Academy or something like that on the same content that the kids might be reading about independently. So there are lots of ways that are quite accessible for kids with disabilities who might need a different learning style to access that without being pulled out of the classroom. Right, especially, I mean, most schools have headphones somewhere. Most schools have a device where they can watch a video or listen to a podcast or whatever it might be. And I, and I mentioned the teens only page with lots of great curse words, which is just part of his self-advocacy. But we tell him, you know, if you use it inappropriately, you have the same consequences as any other kid. So I talked about peer collaboration is so, Samuel just loves being with friends. He loves collaborating with peers. It's just such a big part of his identity and his, and his preference. So in his, <laughs> in his IEP, again, this, the highlighting is just for this presentation, but there's this whole section just about well, how important peer support is, how it can take shape in, in school. I mean, it's re we've made this a focus of his IEP, is the importance of peer support. There's actually a, a line in here that we wrote, but they uh, paraphrased, a major goal of the family is to steadily increase the natural support model for Samuel in the school and community. Do you guys know what natural supports are? It's a, basically a term that means not all support needs to be paid or technological. It can just be friends. You know, all of us have natural supports in our lives, right? Friends or, you know, community entities that support us in different ways. And we want to see that grow for Samuel because that's going to be key to his success as an adult, having lots of social capital, having lots of peer support in the community. So we've made this a really focal point of his IEP. And I don't know if this seems like really out of the box for you, that this would be in an IEP, or? Yeah. It does, yeah. Because usually it's a peer mentor or something, but it's not the same right. equal, equal level. Exactly. It's not seeing equal love. And you know, we've told, Samuel has had some wonderful power professionals over the years, and when we've had the chance, we've told them, listen, if Samuel's across the room working with his friends, and you're on the other side of the room, we think you're doing your job great. We think that's awesome. And don't ever think that you're not doing your job because you're not hovering next to Samuel. But I think a lot of paraprofessionals feel like they're not doing their job unless they're like actively doing something with the kid. And we always say, and we've gotten support from the other people at the school, that's actually like great success if that child is engaging without your support. Any questions or thoughts about that? I mean, I, I just want to think of it as when Samuel starts that class on day one with a new teacher, what do I want to make sure that teacher knows above anything else? And this is really important. Like This is critical to Samuel's success, in addition to them knowing he likes NASCAR and the Red Sox, and they can chat him up about that. Um, so we also actually talk about universal design for learning right in the IEP, that his classwork also best reflects his knowledge and understanding when he completes assignments in a UDL manner. And if we have time at the end of the session, I'll show you a short video he did as a homework assignment that, that really was like the embodiment of, of universal design for learning. So I think the point of having this in there is that teachers should know from the get-go that Samuel may not be able to demonstrate his knowledge in exactly the same way as some of the other kids in the class. That for Samuel, the way that Samuel completes his homework assignments usually is at home he speaks more than he does in school. He speaks some at school, but he's more comfortable and people understand him you know, more readily at home because his language is really heavily distorted through his cerebral palsy. Um, so he speaks out his homework assignments, but it takes him a long time. It could take him 10 minutes to say two sentences and then there's a, somebody scribing what he says. Um, so and, and even writing with his advice is very laborious, very labor intensive. So first of all, it's important that people understand that for Samuel to generate a paragraph is gonna take at least as much time and energy, if not more, than for a typical kid to generate a page. So that's kind of an accommodation that we try and have in there. But we also find that Samuel is very motivated 
to complete assignments in a much more UDL way, where he's finding pictures on Google Images, where he's giving, you know, um, where he's giving certain words in terms that are kind of the keywords. One thing that actually I didn't talk about in the last session, but I should have, which has really been helpful, is we created for Samuel a code that we use for all of his writing samples. And what I mean by that is, so for Samuel, like a lot of kids with communication disorders, it may be so much work for them to speak in perfect, complete sentences with each time. But, but they can say some really important like keywords, uh, but it's like those small words, the ands and the ums, and the, or they might at times be doing research where they're lifting material right from sources, but it needs to be acknowledged that that's been lifted from a source. But he found it, he determined that it should be in there, he's making decisions. So we have a code that we apply to every single writing sample that if it's in italics, it means it was lifted from another source. If it's in quotes, it means Samuel said it. If it's underlined, it means he used his device to say it. And if it's in parentheses, it means that the support person added some filler words. So you might see Samuel generate a paragraph and that teacher very quickly can see exactly what Samuel generated and how. And I think that's something to think about and we have that in his IP as well. Something to think about for kids who might have similar communication disorders to make sure, especially at high school and, and middle school, where, you know, I mean at every age level, but it's just important that it's an authentic representation of what the kid is able to express, right, for assessments. So we that's been a pretty important part of his education, that code. All right, so I'll, this is another movie that you can check on in your own time if you're interested. But it's an 18 minute, it's a really cool movie. What happened was in his sophomore year of high school, Samuel had an English class in which the final assignment was something, um, what does it mean to live the American dream? And it was a, an essay that you're supposed to write or, or, or show it in a different way. In history, they were doing a unit on civil rights movements. And so Samuel decided to, and, and with his teacher's support, he combined his English and history assignment and created this really cool 18 minute film um, called, uh, it's, not, it's called Judith Human. If you just Google Judith Human or Judy Human and Samuel Habib, it'll come up on YouTube. It actually won an a, a award in a, like a Moscow, Russia film festival, a disability film festival. And he interviewed Judy Human, who's a huge disability rights advocate. He Skyped with her. She agreed to a Skype. He recorded the Skype. And then he did all this research about her, about the issues of her time. He found pictures online, he found some videos. And I supported him in the editing because he physically needs that, but he did all the content, all the content decisions, right down to the dissolves and everything, um, and put this movie together. And he spent probably 30 hours on it. And I'm sure for the teachers it was pretty fun to see this as a homework assignment compared to maybe an essay or something. And it's this really cool 18 minute movie. So it was a great example of a really major final assignment done in a universally designed way. All right, so now let me show Shift gears. Any anything you want to bring up yet? Now the IEP has really intersected with transition planning. First of all, just being in the general ed classroom, being with all these friends and his brother who are going to college, that exposure has very much made Samuel think, as I talked about in the keynote, that he plans to go to college, that he wants to be employed, that he wants to have relationships. I think the experience of being in a typical environment has given him all these really high goals that we think are wonderful. He's developed all the social capital in the community with his friends, um, and he's done quite a bit of person-centered planning with his peers, which I'll talk more about in a minute. So person-centered planning. Um, what this means in our world is that since Sam was about seven or eight years old, we have had a person who has some training in person-centered planning from our local, we call them area agencies. They're agencies that support people with disabilities as adults or sometimes they also work in um, early interventions. So you probably have an equivalent here, some entity that does that kind of work. They have a, a wonderful woman, Leslie, who's trained in person-centered planning. And what person-centered planning means to us is that Samuel chooses the people in his life that he really trusts, that he really wants to spend time with and that can help him think about his goals and achieve his goals. About once a year, he invites them all over for pizza at our house, and then we spend about an hour with him identifying his hopes, his dreams, his goals. He's done some work ahead of time to identify some of these things, and then all the people in the room brainstorm how Samuel can achieve these things. And what we find is the kids actually really like these sessions because they start thinking about their own goals and their own hopes, and they're friends with Samuel. They want to they support him and, and, and think about his life and, and, and help that. So it usually starts, because we've been doing these every year for about the last 10 years, um, it usually starts with looking back on some achievements that were made since the last person-centered planning meeting, right? So just think about the words, person-centered planning. It's centered on Samuel and it's about planning for the future. So some of the things that were reached since our last meeting was Samuel went to the Daytona 500, which was a big dream of his. He got Proton, our service dog. 
he, um, let's see, he started going kayaking in this adaptive sports program. He wanted to spend more time without us, with his friends, more time without parents, which we support. Um, he started doing weightlifting as part of his PE, uh, yeah, phys PT work, physical therapy, lots of different stuff. So that's really exciting to sit and create space. How often do we take time in our lives to appreciate all the things we've done, you know, and like achieved in the last year? We should do that as adults too. <laughs> we should do that as much as possible. Um, and then we, we created some ground rules for the meeting. Communicate, use your mind, question authority, be creative. We actually had one of his meetings um, we called, if, your life was, if my life was a video game, because we wanted to encourage the kids, they were all around 13 at that time, he said, think about this as a video game. If anything was possible, if you could do anything, just like a video game, what would your life be? What would, or, you know, for Samuel or your own life? And that gave them permission to just think outside the box. So then, before the meeting, Leslie came over to our house one afternoon and spent some time with Samuel to give him some space and time in his own communication style to identify his short and longer term goals. So everything from what he wanted to do this year for three to five years down the line. So some of his goals were he wanted to communicate more directly with friends through text and email and Facebook. He wanted to break down some of the communication barriers. He wanted to do an internship at the New Hampshire Motor Speedway, our local NASCAR um, track. He wanted to go to a Patriots game. He wanted to make a sequel to Including Samuel, which we're planning to do next year, start working on. He wants to go to college, you know, all these different goals. But it's, again, it's really wonderful to have the space to sit down and think about all your, your short and long-term goals. And then during the meeting, the facilitator was able to hone in kind of through the consensus of the group on one big goal and really expand on it. And the goal they chose was what can we do together socially? Kind of what are some more things we can do? Because when you have a 500-pound wheelchair, guess what? Your friends' homes are not accessible. You can't get into your friends' homes. You can't get into your friends' cars, even now that they're driving at age 17 and 18. So it really limits some of the social opportunities, but they came up with this great list of things that they could do together, so that gave everyone some ideas as to some social stuff they could do together. Um, and then this was navigating challenges. So I'm showing you kind of a mix of different ages from different person-centered planning meetings today. But this one was pretty recently, I think when he was 17. Samuel, as I mentioned, has a lot of fatigue, so they want him to start drinking more coffee. That was one of the suggestions. You know, they said we should check in more often, see if you're up for this, and you know, not assume that you're not up for something just because you're tired a lot. Let's, let's be more proactive. Um, checking out settings ahead of time, like I talked about in the keynote this morning, advocating for more accessibility was a big thing they talked about. But the last two were, I think, some of my favorite things. Talked about um, transportation and health issues. So for transportation, these are now 17, 18 year old kids. They want to learn how to drive our very expensive accessible van, which makes us a little nervous, <laughs> right? My wife is like, yeah, I don't know about that. But as they get older, it becomes more and more feasible to think maybe these kids can, can hop in our van and go places. Um, so that's kind of exciting, but a little nerve wracking, but opens up a lot of opportunities. But this was really amazing. So, so again, these kids are getting older. One of the kids says, Samuel has a G-tube, a gastrointestinal tube, that's continuous feed and he gets medicine throughout the day. So usually an adult needs to be around to give him that medicine. His friends want to learn how to do that. A couple of friends said, we want to learn how to do this so we don't need Samuel to always have an adult nearby. We want to be able to do this so we can go out for a few hours without worrying about that. And that really blew me away. You know, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but I, again, Samuel's 18 now. I think in coming years, all these things are going to be more feasible. So even if it doesn't happen tomorrow, it might happen in a year or two years from now, a lot of these things. So, so this all, and then we did some follow through and specific actions for kind of next steps. When Samuel was younger, we would send this out to the families just so they all were kind of on board as to what some of these plans were that their friend, the kids had made. Um, but this whole thing took maybe an hour. Max, that whole discussion. It's amazing how much you can get done in an hour with pizza and, and lots of energetic kids. That's it. Any, I'm, I'm going to move on, but any questions about the person-centered planning? Does that sound like something you could do? I'll tell you a little, a little side note. Um, so Isaiah, my older son, who's 21 now, I mentioned is in the Grand Canyon right now. Um, He's my non-traditional student, <laughs> honestly. He's the one that hated high school. He hated just sitting and listening. Really active kid, you know, really always wanting to be on the move. And he, he was miserable in high school. So he came home one day and said, I just can't do it anymore. I just hate school. It's towards the end of the year. He was like a freshman or a sophomore. So I took him out for sushi because he likes sushi. I said, let's just sit and talk as long as you want to. Let's just think about what would help you, what would make you know, your life 
feel more manageable? How can we get you through high school in a way that feels like right for you? We just had this no judgment, no you know negativity conversation. Just put it all on the table, and I really learned to do that through the process with Samuel. And we downloaded some guiding questions from online, and I just took notes the whole time and came back and reported out to Betsy and with, with Isaiah. And um, we came up with, this, then we started doing some research and we found a high school program that was experiential based in New Hampshire, and he was able to do a semester program through the school where they went to Ecuador and he learned science and civics and Spanish and all these different skills while biking over the Andes and paddling down the Amazon River Valley and hiking over 19,000 foot volcanoes and it was life changing for him. But none of that would have happened unless we had learned about this whole idea of person-centered planning and like creating space to step back and think about goals and, you know, and, and your life dreams. And really adults should do this as well, I think. It would be a really healthy exercise. So, all right, so kind of winding down here, um, all the work we've done around person-centered planning and IEP development has really informed the transition planning we're doing now. So, it's not a complete coincidence that I took on this whole new Intelligent Lives project now that's looking a lot at transition, and tomorrow I have breakouts where I'm showing uh, some of these new films I'm developing on effective practices in transition that I've been filming all around the country. Um, so, which is also kind of a premiere, I haven't shown these publicly yet, but I will tomorrow. So what I'm learning, both through my own experience, through talking to people around the country, experts in transition, is that there's some common things that are happening around the country that are proven to be successful for transition planning. And I've, we've been able to try and integrate these into Samuel's life, both in school and outside of school. So self-determination strategies and leadership development. I think you've gotten the sense that's been a constant theme throughout Samuel's education. Uh, create leadership opportunities, self-determination. We've always wanted to keep him on a regular high school diploma track. Um, one of the things we did last year was we advocated with the school and they're very receptive that Samuel has a math disability. He just, he struggles so much with math. So um, we had him tested for dyscalculia, which is like a dyslexia but for math. And it was pretty evident that he has some serious math challenges. So we, the special ed director, offered to advocate to the State Department of Ed to have him exempt from algebra because he has a, a math disability. And that would be an accommodation under ADA that if you have a math disability, you should not be prevented from graduating because you can't pass algebra, and the Department of Ed accepted it. And I, I don't know how often this has happened in New Hampshire or anywhere else, but Samuel does not have algebra as a graduation requirement, which if I was hearing over lunch is a major impediment for a lot of kids here and everywhere. But I think it's ridiculous. If you've got, a, I think it's a real ADA, Americans with Disability Act issue if you're not creating that accommodation. So. Um, Anyway, I bring that up because that seemed to be the one hurdle for him to get his high school diploma, but now he's totally on track. Interagency collaboration. When we have these transition meetings, we're bringing in vocational rehabilitation, we're bringing in community, different community groups, because Voc Rehab, I don't know if you're aware, 15% of their budget now has to go towards youth transition services. They call it PETS, pre-employment transition services. So in every state, everywhere, Voc Rehab should be spending 15% of their money. So what we experienced was that Samuel got an internship last summer at the local community access TV station. Voc Rehab paid the salary of a support person during that internship. So that's new funding you guys could access for certain kind of career type experiences for kids with disabilities. Um, so community-based experiences, as I said, through like extended learning opportunities, internships, work, study, apprenticeships. Paid work has been seen as one of the, there's two forces or two factors that are the most significant indicators of post-school employment success for students with disabilities. One of them, surprisingly or not, is that a student has regular household chores and the other is that they have some paid work experience in high school. Those are the two biggest indicators. And kids who have those two things in their life have a 75% chance of having employment as adults. Without those two things, there's a 25% chance of having employment. Um, high family expectations, assistive technology, Samuel's device and his wheelchair and all things like that, but also effective access to mainstream technology, you know, iPads, iPhones, etc. Higher education opportunities and supports. Do you know about the Think College Network? That's a network of colleges all over the country that have specific programs for students with intellectual disability. So if you wanna, you should definitely know about these. For your students who wanna go to college, who might have intellectual disabilities, go to thinkcollege.org and list every program in the country that has these programs. What's that? Think 
College Indiana is ours. We have seven nice. programs. You have seven. That's great. Awesome. <laughs> I did, wasn't, I'm glad you knew that. Yeah. So anyway, there are now college options for students that typically would not have had access to college, which is awesome. And then, of course, for someone like Samuel, it might be more about the physical supports, and certain colleges have better disability services than others. So anyway, winding down, a few notes for parents. Oh, by the way, this I should have said this early on, but this PowerPoint is in on your flash drive. Sorry I didn't tell you at the beginning, but you have access to all this in your flash drive. Um, there are a lot of things parents can do to keep these relationships strong. You know, writing a thank you note. We try to thank our professionals all the time in very specific ways about the great work they're doing. Next time you go to an IP meeting, we often start the meetings by just saying, how are you guys doing? Like, how's it going? What's going well? You know, I mean, just partly we, now we do it more through Samuel's PowerPoint, but when he was younger, that's how we like to open the conversation. Like, how are things going for you? Not, this is what we want, or this is what we're concerned about, but, you know, open that conversation up in a healthy way. And we try to be open-minded to the viewpoint of the team. You know, the fact that they have a lot of expertise that we don't have, and we want to understand and learn from them. And I'll just leave this up on the screen. You can check it out. These are just some ground rules we found have been really helpful in terms of common denominators at these IP meetings. You know, particularly things like using age-appropriate vocabulary and inflection in talking to the student. These aren't, it's not like we post these at the beginning of every IEP meeting, but I think these are some common understandings we've reached with the school. And, and I, there, are, there are times when people start talking in ways that there's no way Samuel's gonna understand, not because he's not smart, but because it's like acronyms and lingo. And I'll just turn to Samuel and say, did you understand that? And he'll be like, nope. <laughs> I said, would you mind rephrasing that in a way that, that makes sense for Samuel? Um, all right, I'm sorry I kind of sped through a lot here, but there was a lot of ground to cover uh, and, and towards the end of our day. A few more minutes of anything at all you want to ask. Great, well I think we're about out of time anyway. I hope this was helpful for you. Thanks so much and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks. <laughs>